up guys, it's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we talking about today? Today is going to be another interesting case study. It actually is the 1999 Moore, Oklahoma F5 tornado, which actually didn't just affect Moore, but a lot of surrounding areas within the greater Oklahoma City area. And it was part of a larger outbreak as well. Very true, very true. That day over 70 tornadoes occurred within the southern plains over south central Kansas into Oklahoma and north Texas. Yep, and this is actually called the Great Plains Tornado Outbreak of May 3rd and 4th, 1999. So what we're going to do is we're going to give an overall synopsis of the weather events that took place, the setup, and then we'll specifically drill down to that one particular storm that created that F5 tornado. But before we get started, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss another Meteorology Monday. Okay, so we saw a really good write-up that was put out by the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Norman, Oklahoma. They had very detailed information. The, lots of lot details. Of things, there were lot lots of, of details. And then there were some other government entities like the Storm Prediction Center that we'll also pull some images from. All these will be linked below for your review as well. So let's go ahead and discuss the overall synoptic level features of this storm system. Here we go. On the morning of May 3rd, 1999, the sky was generally cloudy with a deck of low stratus clouds spread over much of the state of Oklahoma. A dry line had extended from near Gage, Oklahoma to near Childress, Texas around dawn, which separated warm, moist air to the east and drier, cooler air to the west. Surface dew points were in the low to mid 60s east of the dry line, and temperatures were not much above that in the mid to upper 60s. This caused a thick layer of stratus clouds to be present that morning. At the same time, the Storm Prediction Center and the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Norman, Oklahoma, were closely monitoring the weather conditions setting up that day. The Storm Prediction Center issued their early morning outlook that painted most of Kansas, Oklahoma, and North Texas in a slight risk. The general consensus by the Storm Prediction Center and Norman National Weather Service Office forecasters was for a severe weather threat over the southern plains, which included the risk of some supercells. However, the exact location of the greatest threat was not certain at the time of this issuance. In fact, there was enough confidence in how things were setting up that the threat of severe thunderstorms was mentioned in most of the zone forecasts for the Oklahoma counties at the 4.30 a.m. Central Daylight Time issuance. By 6.30 a.m. Central Daylight Time, the National Weather Service office in Norman began mentioning the risk of severe weather in their thunderstorm outlook products the contents of which mentioned the increasing low-level moisture, dry line, and approaching upper-level low-pressure trough would combine to cause a threat of large hail, damaging winds, and tornadoes. It also cautioned emergency managers and spotter groups to be prepared for possible activation that afternoon. As the morning progressed, the Storm Prediction Center and National Weather Service forecasters became more certain of a significant severe weather event unfolding that day. Low clouds began to break up in advance of the dry line. This allowed strong sunshine to filter through and heat the lower atmosphere, adding to the instability. High cirrus clouds overspread the area that morning and into the afternoon. However, that did not significantly reduce the risk of severe weather, as some filtered sunshine was still observed in most locations throughout the day. The incoming solar heating combined with abundant low-level moisture from the Gulf of Mexico would combine to produce a very unstable air mass ahead of the dry line. Later in the morning, the 12Z 7 a.m. Central Daylight Time upper air sounding data came in and showed the atmospheric profile, including how much moisture and wind energy were in place. One tool weather forecasters use is the ability to modify the sounding data by adjusting the low level temperature and moisture profiles to see how much energy will be available later that day when there's additional heating from the sun. They noticed that in the afternoon, the cap, which is a layer of warmer air above the surface that would inhibit rising motion, would weaken and convective available potential energy, or CAPE, would exceed 4,000 joules per kilogram. Typically, CAPE values around 2,000 joules per kilogram are sufficient for the development of severe thunderstorms. So if these modified values were realized by the actual atmosphere later that afternoon, combined with the strong directional shear, it was climatologically favorable for severe supercells and tornadoes to form. 
Armed with this information, the Storm Prediction Center upgraded the severe thunderstorm risk to moderate at 11.15 a.m. Central Daylight Time. Here's a brief statement made in that outlook. We'll provide sufficient shear for a few strong or violent tornadic supercells given the abundant low-level moisture and the high instability. The National Weather Service in Norman issued a thunderstorm outlook product at 12.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time, stating that the increasing threat of a severe weather outbreak, including tornadoes, would take place late in the afternoon and into that evening. As the early afternoon wore on, the potential for a significant severe weather outbreak appeared more and more likely. Special weather balloon launches were authorized to measure the pre-storm environment. Around 1 p.m., wind profiles revealed an environment that was highly conducive for tornado development. This included winds increasing and changing direction with height, meaning speed and directional wind shear. The balloon soundings also revealed temperature profiles indicating a very unstable atmosphere. A special article on the Norman Weather Partners website points out, it became more obvious something major was looming. At 3.49 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the Storm Prediction Center upgraded to a high risk for the entire National Weather Service Norman, Oklahoma forecast area. So there you have this synoptic setup the morning of before any of the storms actually happened. Something interesting to point out is that SPC and the NWS forecast office there in Norman, Oklahoma started out the day with a slight risk. It was kind of evident that they were expecting some severe weather that day, but not a huge tornado outbreak that this event turned out to be. So they started out the morning with a slight risk, and then as things went on, they started going, oh wow, let's issue a moderate, and then eventually they got to that high risk. Okay, so that's the events that led up to about mid-afternoon. So now let's go ahead and let's zero in on the actual storm for this case study, and that is the F5 Moore Oklahoma tornado, which as you'll discover as we read, it actually encompassed a whole lot more than just Moore Oklahoma. The storm began around 3.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time in Tillman County, Oklahoma. It moved to the northeast, and once it reached parts of Comanche County, it produced its first tornado at 4.51 p.m. Central Daylight Time, seven miles east-northeast of Medicine Park, Oklahoma. As the storm crossed from Comanche County into Cato County, it produced four other tornadoes, one of which was rated an F3. The F3 tornado struck a rural area just east of Apache. The sixth tornado that the storm produced crossed from Cato County into Grady County and was rated a strong F3 tornado. This tornado ended shortly after striking the northwest sides of Chickasha. The storm gained intensity and became better organized as it moved into Grady County. As it moved into the Amber area in central Grady County, it produced a tornado that would become the most famous tornado of the entire outbreak, and one of the most famous tornadoes in U.S. history, the Bridge Creek, Oklahoma City, and Moore F5 tornado. This tornado developed in Grady County about two miles south-southwest of Amber, and quickly intensified as it crossed Oklahoma State Highway 92. F4 damage was first discovered about four miles east-northeast of Amber and extended for six and a half miles as the tornado continued to move northeast. Two areas of F5 damage were observed in the Bridge Creek area. The first was in the Willow Lake Addition, a rural subdivision of mobile homes and some concrete slab homes in Bridge Creek in far eastern Grady County. Two homes were completely swept from their concrete slabs and about one dozen automobiles were carried about a quarter of a mile. All mobile homes in this area in the direct path of the tornado were obliterated resulting in a high concentration of fatalities. Asphalt pavement about one inch thick was also peeled from the section of rural road EW-125. The second area of F5 damage was observed about one mile west of the grady mclean County line and consisted of a cleanly swept slab home with foundation anchor bolts and another vehicle lofted a quarter of a mile. The maximum width of damage in Bridge Creek was estimated to be one mile. Approximately 200 mobile homes and houses were destroyed, and hundreds of other structures were damaged. Twelve people died in Bridge Creek, nine in mobile homes. All fatalities and the majority of injuries were concentrated in the Willow Lake Edition, Southern Hills Edition, and Bridge Creek Estates, which consisted mostly of mobile homes. Compared to sections of Oklahoma and Cleveland counties, which were also in the path of this tornado, Eastern Grady County, including the Bridge Creek area, 
was rural and sparsely populated. The tornado maintained a nearly straight path to the northeast as it entered McLean County. An exception was when it made a slight jog to the right and moved directly over the 16th Street overpass in Newcastle, where a woman was killed when she was blown out from under the overpass. The tornado continued into northern sections of rural Newcastle and crossed the interstate again just north of the US 62 Newcastle interchange. While this tornado was moving through the northern portion of Newcastle, a weak satellite tornado touched down in a field in rural North Newcastle. Two areas of F4 damage were observed in McLean County associated with the main tornado. The first area overlapped the Grady McLean County line and extended to about three miles northwest of Newcastle while the other area was observed two miles northwest of Newcastle. In McLean County, 38 homes and two businesses were destroyed, and 40 homes were damaged. Damage then diminished to F2 intensity as the tornado crossed the Canadian River into northern Cleveland County and southern Oklahoma City. Damage was rated F2 in this area, with a path width averaging one half mile. The first major housing development to be struck in Cleveland County was Country Place Estates, where about 50 homes were damaged. A dozen of these homes received F4 damage. One slab home was cleanly swept from its foundation, and several vehicles were picked up from the subdivision and tossed across Pennsylvania Avenue, a distance of approximately one quarter of a mile. This particular area of damage has been rated a high F4 or low F5. The tornado then tracked through East Lake Estates, a densely populated housing development where three fatalities occurred. Entire rows of homes were flattened to piles of rubble. Four adjacent homes on one street were nearly cleaned off their foundations, leaving only concrete slabs, which earned an F5 rating. Three other homes in this housing division also received F5 damage, with the remaining destruction rated high F4. Three people also died in the Emerald Springs apartments across the street from East Lake Estates. One two-story apartment building on the north end of the apartment complex was virtually flattened, and received an F5 rating. The tornado then entered the western city limits of Moore in Cleveland County and produced damage a half to three quarters of a mile wide. Maximum damage rated high F4, low F5 extended northeast with several large groups of homes flattened. Four people died in this residential area. The tornado appeared to weaken just slightly after crossing Interstate 35. However, it remained a formidable storm with widespread high F3, low F4 damage observed in the Highland Park residential area south of the First Baptist Church on 27th Street in Moore. Escaping with relatively minor damage and being located near the halfway point of the tornado path, the First Baptist Church in Moore eventually served as the primary coordination center for most tornado relief efforts. The tornado then continued northeast and entered the southern portion of a sparsely populated industrial district. F4 damage continued through this area to near the Cleveland-Oklahoma County border. Moving into Oklahoma County, the tornado curved northward through the remaining industrial district north of Interstate 240, where two businesses were destroyed. This damage was rated F4, and two people lost their lives. A freight car with an approximate weight of 18 tons was picked up intermittently and blown three quarters of a mile across an open field. Gouge marks were observed in the field every 50 to 100 yards, suggesting the freight car had been airborne for at least a short distance. When the main tornado was moving through southeast Oklahoma City, another tornado touched down briefly near the intersection of southeast 80th and Sooner Road in Oklahoma County. The main tornado then entered residential neighborhoods where a woman was killed in her house. Crossing into Dell City in Oklahoma County, the tornado moved through the highly populated Dell Air Housing Addition, killing six people and damaging or destroying hundreds of homes, many with F3 or F4 damage. The tornado then crossed Sooner Road where it damaged an entry gate and several costly structures at Tinker Air Force Base. The tornado then crossed into Midwest City in Oklahoma County, destroying one building and damaging two others. Widespread F3 and F4 damage continued as the tornado moved across Interstate 40. There, numerous motels and businesses were destroyed. Some of the damage through this area was rated high F4. However, low F5 was considered. The tornado then continued into another residential area between Southeast 15th and Reno Ave, where three fatalities occurred. High F4 damage was inflicted to four homes in this area. Damage then diminished rapidly to F0 or F1 
as the tornado crossed Reno Ave. The tornado dissipated three blocks north of Reno Ave. In total, this storm produced 14 tornadoes, five of which were rated as strong or violent tornadoes, F2 or higher, during its three and a half hour lifespan. The combined damage path length of all 14 tornadoes was over 70 miles. The Oklahoma State Department of Health in Oklahoma City recorded 36 direct fatalities. In addition, five people died of illness or accident during or shortly after the tornado and were not considered in the direct fatality total. The number of injuries was estimated at 583. An estimated 1,800 homes were destroyed and 2,500 homes were damaged, resulting in approximately $1 billion in damage. Another thing to note that we didn't put in there is the wind speed for this main tornado, which was 301 miles per hour plus or minus 20-ish miles per hour. There's some that say it's below 300, there's some that say it's much higher than 300 miles per hour, and back in that day we didn't have quite the technology that we do today to get an accurate measurement, but this is one of the strongest recorded winds in the history of everything. <laughs> that's right, that's right. At the time, based on the technology we had and the storm chasers, 301 miles an hour was quite an amazing, you know, recording yeah. of, of this tornado. There was always talk about tornadoes being an F5, which is 261 miles an hour plus, mm -hmm. goes to 318, but just trying to contemplate a 300 mile an hour wind, it, it just, yeah, you see homes destroyed and, and lives are lost, but you know, what's the difference between 200 and 300? I mean, after a certain point, it just gets to right. be, you know, it's total destruction. Well, to actually have something that could measure 300 miles an hour in a tornado was just incredible for the time. 1999, it's just amazing when those numbers came out, you know, when they were yeah. starting to issue their findings, 301 miles an hour, plus or minus, that's incredible. Yeah, and it's a record that has stood to this day, all these years later. And another thing is this is the first time in recorded history that they used the term tornado emergency. They decided that this event was so severe and this tornado so destructive that they used a new term, tornado emergency, to try to convey to the audience just how dangerous a storm like this is. So who winds up issuing the, a tornado emergency? Well, that would be the NWS office, or the National Weather Service office. In this case, it was the Norman, Oklahoma National Weather Service office that issued this very first tornado emergency. And since 1999, there have been 195 tornado emergencies issued by the National Weather Service here in the United States. So we have our tornado watch, we have our tornado warning, and then tornado emergency. So an mm -hmm. additional granularity layer for maybe specific counties or specific towns within counties to even heighten that urgency even more right. so that the public can act and get out of the way or protect themselves as best they can. Yes, and usually these tornado emergencies are issued for towns that are very densely populated. So there's a lot of people going to be impacted by a storm moving through. So there you have it, the May 3rd, 1999 Bridge Creek, Moore, Oklahoma F5 tornado. Thank you guys so much for suggesting this case study and we have plenty more coming. We hope you enjoy this one. Uh, we have the uh, 2013 Moore, Oklahoma tornado and we also have the 2013 El Reno tornado event as well as many others so we are getting to them one at a time so we really appreciate your suggestions again if you like what you saw make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below you don't want to miss the next case studies coming up follow us over on our social media Facebook and Instagram you guys know the drill as well as our website and the school weather which is linked below also down there are all the links for everything that we talked about including a couple papers where all the images are from until next time I'm Kayla and I'm Jim thanks for watching and we'll see you at the next meteorology Monday Thank you. I can't form words today! <laughs> Golly! That's going at the end of the video. Oh.